have with us today, uh, Bree Williams. And Bree, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Bree is from State Street Global Advisors. She is the head of practice management there and spends a ton of time talking about and thinking about and researching some of these topics that can be kind of difficult, uh, but in order to make the conversations flow a little bit more smoothly and to give everybody tools to have good conversations. So Bree, we are thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Um, I am, for anyone who doesn't know or doesn't ca or cares, I'm Megan McCartan. I'm head of marketing here at Hightower. And we are, are happy to be able to put these webinars together, hoping to be able to give some good information to our clients out there. Um, so first of all, uh, just to level set, Brie, you and I had, had chatted about this a little bit. This can be a really, really tough topic. It can, can be a depressing topic, but there's some silver linings too. Can we kick, can you just kick us off with those silver linings a little bit? Sure. So it's my pleasure to be here. And I do think that uh, this is such an important conversation and it's, it's just the beginning. It's a start. So my ask for all of us is just to simply keep an open mind, because when you think of the, the nature of the conversation, which is about aging and what happens to our brains in just the natural aging process and how that can impact our cognitive capability and our ability ultimately to manage our money in a way that matches and aligns with our values um, and what we envision as control and peace of mind. So when you think about the possibilities of an impairment of any kind, doesn't have to be just on your brain, Think of it as a contingency plan. What if? And if you approach it in that manner, then you have a backup should you ever need it. And in order for that to be effective in implementation, you actually have to have the conversations, put a plan into place, and then communicate any roles and responsibilities with families, trusted contacts, and your financial advisory team. So bottom line, I think if you want a silver lining, it's about being informed because knowledge is power. And on this subject, particularly empowering. I think that's a, a great way to level set it. Give knowledge is power. That's what we're here to be able to do. Yes. So you're not a scientist. Um, no. but can you spend <laughs> a, like a tiny bit just to talk a little bit about the science? Like what are the things that we look for with this cognitive decline and how, that, what are we looking for for science? Sure. So again, you know, we look to science as well as academic studies just to give us facts. Facts is information and it helps us get a baseline of understanding of what may happen. First and foremost, age is just a number. If I call out a number and it's yours, there's no need to panic that suddenly something's going to change. We will all age differently. We're all individuals. And we just have to look to some commonalities that science and academia can give us baselines for. So we have a general understanding of what may happen when you reach certain milestones on the living well, living long journey. So looking at the science and keeping this very simple, you know, as we progress on our journey and age, the speed at which we generate and transform and manipulate new information begins to decrease at a certain point. And that's mental processing, if you will, and it's called fluid intelligence. And research shows us that even individuals with very healthy brains will have less fluid intelligence as we age. But that's just only one part of the story. So if you think about the second part of the story, it's crystallized intelligence, which is another way of saying wisdom. So when you think of crystallized intelligence, that's your accumulation of your knowledge your experiences, and you're building that until um, around age 60. And then it starts to plateau. Doesn't mean you can't learn new things. You absolutely can. But when you, when you think about your ability to draw on past experiences and continue to add to that, it just starts to change around age 60. So until about age 80, we start to then see more of a significant drop off. So you have fluid intelligence, which is typically in our younger selves. That's often why, you know, your grandchildren um, are better at doing, you know, the fast and furious mental processing where you probably can beat their pants off at a crossword puzzle, just building on experience and knowledge versus creating it. So yeah. let me give you a real example. So if you're thinking about your, a, a father and a daughter and they're at a restaurant 
So the fluid intelligence is going to help the daughter probably calculate that tip a lot faster. Whereas the father's crystallized intelligence is probably going to help him outperform his daughter when looking at analysis for um, market trends or performance in his portfolio as an example. Neither is good or bad. It's just a difference in how our brain ages and what changes in mental processing. So as we grow, we can see different changes in our abilities that can impact our creative thinking, our problem solving, our ability to retain new information. Um, and to some extent, that's all very normal. Uh, where some progressive memory loss can become a little bit more abnormal, those may signal something like the onset of mild cognitive decline, um, which can happen at any age. But typically, we see that measured cognitive performance begin to change around our age of retirement. So when you look to the more advanced spectrum of serious illness or change in cognitive ability, we would think of Alzheimer's or dementia, um, which are very real conditions, all medically diagnosed. And you can see the signs here also showing that those individuals with those types of conditions definitely have impact to their brain and its function. And often, long before formal diagnoses are actually made, which is why we're having this conversation, because it does create a very serious financial risk for our loved ones and ourselves um, when we're at the helm of our finances and we're unaware of these impacts that have a can have a negative effect on our ability to live our financial life on our terms and protect our assets. So I'm gonna jump in and follow up with that a little bit, even before we go to some demographics. So um, I, if in Alzheimer's, that's one, you know, more of an extreme cognitive decline, but even, you know, as you're talking about in your fifties and sixties, I mean, I'm thinking, talking about the crystal intelligence, you know, my, my daughters can so fast, like they'll scroll through things so fast on their phone, whereas I'm gonna stop and read more slowly. They're, they're catching some stuff and I'm catching different stuff. It's a different way the brain works and I'm not mm -hmm. seeing it yet. But when do you when do you have those conversations, right? Before it becomes, and how do you have those conversations of, of talking to your parents? So because I feel like in some cases it's embarrassing, right? It's they, they feel like they're going to be embarrassed because you just said you want them to have that financial control. How can you have the conversation to maintain it? If what are the pieces that you think through with that? Sure. So a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, like when. When do you start thinking about this contingency plan, this what if plan? I would recommend that you consider having this contingency plan as part of your retirement planning process in general. So when does that typically start? Usually we start thinking about our retirement planning uh, as early as our 40s. I mean, you're clearly starting to save for retirement as soon as you enter into some form of receiving a check. Mm -hmm. And you get more serious about the construction of how aggressively are you saving and are you on track for when you want to retire, how you want to retire, and that typically becomes a more complex and serious conversation when you approach your 40s mm -hmm. um, and you're making some, some more definitive choices. At that same time, you should be thinking about what does my retirement look like? And if I should ever become incapacitated in any way, not just cognitive function changing, who is my trusted contact? Is that a family member? Um, is it a trusted friend? Um, is it a professional fiduciary that's part of your financial advisory team? Is it a combination of a few? Um, there's no one size fits all approach, but it is about putting some of those key pieces in place. So if a parent wants to identify their eldest daughter as the trusted contact, she needs to know. And she needs to understand what does that mean? And if she is contacted, when will she be contacted? Why would she be contacted? And what is she expected to do? And what are her limitations? Trusted contact is not someone that has power of attorney or suddenly takes over. All of those things can be worked out. So you've got a combination of some verbal, written, and legal documentation to work through all over a series of time. This is not something you're going to do in one meeting. So how do you bring this up? Uh, this is something that if you are communicating as a family with respect, 
any dialogue can have a little bit more of a less emotional, less sensitive component to it. But the respect is key because it's not about, I'll use myself as an example, it's not about what I want for my mom. It's about what she wants and how can I help? So right there is the key to approaching a conversation with both an open mind and a realistic attitude towards, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to listen actively to what mom wants or mom and dad. And then if they would like me to be a part of this, how I can help and what I need to begin to know. Um, when you're talking about a change in one's cognitive capability, you're, you want to be very careful that you're not approaching them in terms of upsetting the apple cart and making them feel less important, out of control, or that they're losing their mind. Mm -hmm. Now, if these are more serious conditions, they need to definitely go see a medical professional for proper diagnosis. You should not be doing this on your own as a family. And that can often be a really difficult step. But if you take the time to fold it into a regular financial planning process, and this is where the advisory team can be really helpful, it puts it in a neutral ground as just part of health and wealth being intertwined mm -hmm. and setting ourselves up for success. What's a great analogy? We buy insurance, correct? We buy insurance to, for the house, for the car, and for other, and our lives. We hope the house doesn't burn down. We hope the car doesn't get totaled and we hope we don't pass before our time. But you have that contingency plan in place to protect that asset, whether it's personal human being, or a physical thing that is a part of your net worth. So if you take that same approach of insurance has its role in the financial life, so too should a contingency plan about protecting yourself should you be incapacitated in any way. I think something that you just said is very key, um, stood out to me, but then you bring the financial advisor in because then mm -hmm. you've got, it's an objective party who can take the, any stigma out of a conversation and not make it as personal. I, I remember being told the reason you hire a lawyer is so, or, you know, talk to a lawyer so you don't have to bring in more lawyers. You just, you know, <laughs> to avoid those family fights, right? Yeah. Um, but part of what you were saying is some of that is proactive, right? Like you're setting up, mm -hmm. I want to make sure my kids are in good shape. They, I've put these checklists in. What if you've got a parent you know, a lot of us are in this, this sandwich generation. What if you've got a parent who hasn't done those things yet? How do you start that conversation? Because I feel like that's where, you know, I'm worried I'm worried about you. Well, it's none of your business. Or, you know, how, how can you, maybe, maybe they don't say that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. So if they just really big picture, love and money are two of the most emotional topics in the world. So what you're trying to do is now take a conversation that is really about the end of one's life when we think about it, because you're planning for the end and you're trying to plan for having the control and peace of mind you want, as well as a, a means to protect yourself and your loved ones. So it's a necessary conversation. So if it's the child or children that are bringing it up or even the spouse, you know, because we have, it can be the same age, it can be a bigger age gap. You know, the, the ultimate goal, regardless of your role, is if something were to happen to me and I would not come home the next day or wake up, would I be leaving any of my loved ones in a deer in a headlight moment? Mm -hmm. And if you feel you would, then you can benefit from at least going through some of these discussions. So it's about protecting yourself and giving you control and peace of mind by having that plan. So I bring it back to your financial goals, your values, and living life on your terms. And that it, at some point, will require some sort of inclusion from spouse and or children or trusted individuals or a combination thereof. It, many of us will be lucky enough to be able to manage our finances well into our later years and may require little, if any, assistance. We all hope for that. But assuming that will be what unfolds, hope is not a strategy. And when we rely on that as our strategy, then we leave ourselves very vulnerable and we can become either victims of fraud and abuse 
or we could make decisions that are detrimental to our retirement income. And if we think about longevity, we're all living so much longer these days, thanks to medical science, we should be planning for the 100 year life. And we should be thinking about some different variables of little assistance, middle assistance, a lot of assistance. So you do have a chance to have a say if you can, and if you can support the means to make that possible, it will require some roles and responsibilities. So it's just a good family business or like business discussion, if you will, to have as a family. And I remember, you know, talking about this with my in-laws and it ranges the gamut from, okay, guys, this is where the family plots are. And this is what we want our funeral to be like. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so morbid. But then I'm like, wait a minute, I need to hear this. I need to understand this because they're looking for help from me so I can execute against what their vision is. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. It's giving them control. Exactly that. Yes. It's, it's not, yes, it's morbid to think of them dying today, but then they're in control yeah. at that eventual point. So there's a few different avenues I wanted to kind of follow from what you just said. Um, one of them is how are the, how has the pandemic changed some of this? I cannot wait till we no longer bring up the question, how has the pandemic changed, right? But how has the pandemic changed some of these conversations or has it made it easier? So I think there's a bit of a blessing. I, I try to be a little bit more optimistic in my outlook, but I do think there's a bit of a blessing that the global pandemic brought and it, it did push us into a closer environment with a smaller group and typically family centric center than we typically would have. So a lot of people return to the central house, um, either out of necessity um, or a need for company. Uh, so people were not on their own if they didn't have to be. Also forced a lot of time together that then led to conversations more naturally about values. Mm -hmm. So it was the perfect time to start talking about some of the mechanics when you think about wealth transfer intergenerationally, um, whether that's when you're still living or when you pass on, um, your wishes, your wants, your needs for spouses and children, um, should something change? Because the reality of the global pandemic, especially in the beginning, it was very negative about illness and death and everyone was vulnerable to being a possible victim of COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you, you had to face a little bit of the reality of your mortality. Right. Um, so it pushed a lot of these conversations around a state plan to the forefront. And that naturally leads to some values conversation, which are great to have with families. And you just have to sort of get over yourself when you think about some of the uncomfortableness mm -hmm. behind facing the reality that, you know, at some point, mom won't be here. Um, or, you know, if something beyond my control, I'm not here tomorrow. I want to leave things as neat and tidy as I can. I know I won't get to everything, but it gives me the ability to feel I had a say. And more importantly, I can sleep a little bit more comfortably at night. Right. And it, it almost, it sounds, I'm, it normalized the conversation a little bit. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It was like, this, this is what we're seeing. We have to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So, we talked a little bit about um, how it can be embarrassing in some cases to have these these conversations. Another path is that in, you know as part of the title of this web webinar is kind of thinking through how if you don't have these plans, if you don't have the right guardrails in place, the financial abuse that is out there, and how can you guard against that? How can you spot it? Um, maybe you can give us some real life examples um, because I know in some cases someone that's a victim to it again, be embarrassed. Like I, I don't, my dad's saying, I, I don't want to tell you I fell for this scheme or whatever, because then you'll think less of me. So can you go through a little bit of what you're seeing and what we can do? Of course. And, and I would also say is you don't have to be um, an elder in our society to, be, to fall prey to any scam. Um, they're pretty sophisticated these days. So your, your best defense is a good offense where we can get uh, up to speed on what are the top five to 10 financial scams, how do they work? Uh, and what do you look for? Uh, so you can watch out with a little bit more of your eyes are wide open. 
Um, you can also, because a lot of this is conversation in the media. So if you're looking for a way to start this conversation, kind of centering on the scams that are out there today is a very neutral ground to talk about. Uh, because the five o'clock, six o'clock news was talking about the grandparent scam, you know, three weeks ago, or the several um, COVID scams that were even out there. And then we also saw a rise in charitable giving scams as well. So anyone can be in that position. But when you think about fraudsters, they're not, they're going to target what's their sweet spot. And their sweet spot is those that are more vulnerable. And that does tend to be our older population. And they're vulnerable for a few reasons. Often, and we just set COVID aside for a second, um, they may be on their own a lot more, a lot more alone time. So they're craving a little bit more of that attention, that contact, um, and they're, they're, they want to think the best of, of people. We all do. And then you also have to think about if there is a cognitive capacity change, even a mild one, you know, that can change one's mindset and perception to what's real and what maybe is just a good story um, or someone, you know, posing as something that they're not. So it's just easier for that segment of the population to fall prey. Mm -hmm. uh, but it still doesn't mean I won't fall for something, it's very possible. So there's different extremes. So when I look to examples, you know, we had um, spoken with an individual investor who was a single mom and she started to uh, need to help her father who at that point was um, suffering from Alzheimer's and in a form of assisted living at that stage. As she was trying to get her arms around the situation, including his finances, she began tripping over all of the wrongs, um, misspent money, mismanaged accounts, so many open accounts. It, it was a very difficult puzzle piece, if you will, for her to put together on her own. Where And, and the good news is she did find a financial advisory team that helped her figure it out had the fiduciary mindset that she needed, but also more importantly for her, approached her and her family with a generational uh, philosophy. Yeah. And that, that was really what she needed because it's a lot for one person to put all that back together and then try and protect, but also proactively manage. Um, that in itself is a job. So mm -hmm. having a team and she put her own team together was the, the benefit. Whereas if someone is more proactive, and they're sharing some of the basic checklist items, like here's my healthcare proxy, this is my trusted contact, these are my, this is my financial advisor and the team, this is how to reach them, um, this is what they do for me, this is this four accounts that I have, the three credit cards, just the checklist of where to put my hands on accounts and people, should I ever need to, uh, if something were to happen, I'm already four steps ahead of where someone else might've been if there's no conversation whatsoever. Um, but by simply just having dinner table chats around, hey, did you see the segment on the news tonight that was talking about the COVID scam? Um, oh, or when, remember Equifax had that issue and people were talking about freezing their accounts. Um, you know, I want my mom to ask me those questions. She's a very smart woman. She's only 75. I hope she has lots of years ahead of her. But we talk about those things. And often she's the first one to bring it to my attention. Um, and we'll just chat and explore and figure it out. And she's making all the choices. And I'm just there as guide and a sounding board and a resource for her and her advisory team. So in the example you just gave, I felt it's it can be overwhelming, right? This mm -hmm. thing, and she's overturning all of this stuff. What, how, what if you're not working with a financial advisor? How can you, like, what should you look for? It sounds like she got to a great spot. And this, mm -hmm. this session is not about financial advisors abusing anybody because you know, oftentimes they're the helping hand. They're the one that gets comes. So how do you, if you're not working with an advisor, what should you look for? What are those experts that you need to bring into the, to the one's life? So when you think about putting people and measures in place for your financial life. It's a combination of ultimately financial and legal individuals. And what you're looking for is someone that's gonna give you structure and documentation that mm -hmm. is in aligned with your values on how you wanna manage your wealth, 
and also maximize it so you can get to your wishes, not just your needs when you think about your priorities and what you wanna do short, midterm and long-term. So every individual working with an advisor or not at a, at a minimum should be able to identify the location of all of their financial accounts. That's bank accounts, it's any credit cards, it's any loan information and so on. Um, so it's all organized. And that's, again, going to take a little bit of time. Don't stress out and try and do it all in one sitting. Break it down into like 20 minute money dates for yourself, if you will, just begin to organize that. And if you find you want support, an advisory team can give you more structure to that organization and maybe even make the organization itself much easier. So you can focus on macro, they can focus on the micro. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, you need to think about the health and wealth. So you need a living will and medical directives. We talked briefly about a health proxy. Um, those are things you should look at annually, make sure whoever you've designated um, as either beneficiaries or people that need to act on your behalf are still the right people. Things change, life's change, the daily living chaos often gets buried among some of our important priorities and we just put it off and put it off and put it off. And it's not unheard of where, you know, someone's already on to their second marriage and yet their beneficiaries are still affiliated with uh, the marriage number one. Mm -hmm. So you don't want little things like that to be a reality if the proverbial bus strikes you out because you probably had wanted some changes at that point. So living wills, medical directives for uh, that in place, power of attorney, just in case. You need that, a durable power of attorney and oh, your legal expert can help you with that. But you also wanna think about some legacy planning components once you start thinking more seriously about your retirement planning. And again, it's about your wishes and your wants. So it's managing it on your terms with your values. And it's, it's about from your children and other loved ones and spouse, it's our ability to respect your wishes. And if it's getting tense, having that third party objective financial advisor um, or even lawyer, you know, can be very helpful in equalizing the tension a little bit, but also structuring the steps in a very manageable way, um, because it's going to take a little bit of time to put your custom roadmap together. So it, I started this by saying we didn't want to be, have an all sinus, but you know, you've kept saying such an important thing, which is their financial health and, you know, thinking through their control and financial health and wealth. Mm -hmm. How much, I mean, if you're thinking of demographics, we are living longer, right? Like exactly. Yeah. I want mom, I told her she's got, she's got to live to 150. That's her bogey, but we're living longer. And so how, what about those conversations? Do you have examples of kind of, you know, having conversations of, my parents want to be able to do these kinds of things. How do I plan that way? How do we think differently to be able to achieve the good things? Sure. So I think arming yourself with some facts is very helpful. Um, so when we think about financial damage, uh, which you know is a scary thought, and sometimes that can motivate someone into taking action, um, and we think about changes to our capacity, you know the financial damage can begin well before we're diagnosed with even mild cognitive impairment, which is more serious than just, you know, the normal process of, of aging where your brain just moves a little bit slower. Um, and it can cost us a lot of money. Um, and if we think about it as, you know, I hate to say, you know, in, in industry, fraudulent behavior, it's billions of dollars each year in America. So just some data points on that, Every year, one in 20 older adults is exploited. And unfortunately, that's by a family member. Fraudsters are more often people we know than the stranger. Um, and it's unfortunate. Again, that's why having plans, documents, communication, roles and responsibilities um, will help greatly. It's when there's a surprise and I don't want a surprise unless it's in a blue box with a white bow is the right. only one. Um, but, you know, the other surprises are not so pleasant um, for both the wealth creator and the family or individual is trying to help them. When we think about, you said embarrassing a few times, only one in 44 elder abuse cases are reported. And it is because people are embarrassed. Um, you know, would I be calling uh, to report that I was fell for a scam, 
I probably think about that really hard before wanting to become a statistic. Um, and that's just what people go through is they're just embarrassed for falling for it, whether it was a little bit of money or a lot of money. Um, and they may not even share that with their loved ones, including a significant other. When we think about, does this affect gender differently? It does. Women are nearly twice as likely uh, than men to be victims. It could be because of longevity factor. Sorry, guys, women are going to outlive you by, by five years. Um, women also spend more of their um, adult retirement life often alone, um, meaning uncoupled. Um, most victims age between 80 and 89, and they live alone. So just some facts, you know, ultimately become part of the picture. And I think that's really helpful. And when you are considering people that perhaps are not in your trusted network or contact list, you know, you can start to see if there's a family member or a friend and they're involved in someone's finances and they're paying their bills, as an example. If I discover that and that versus being told that uh, in like a family meeting setting, I might be suspicious. Like, mm -hmm. is that person really acting uh, in their best interest? Um, and then when you start to kind of peel the layers of the onion, you begin to see you know, like small consistent withdrawals of a couple thousand on a regular basis, you know, they're starting to siphon off of that person's account. So you can look at that in like, what's a scam that makes sense that we've heard in the news, the, the uh, romance scheme. Right. Where someone comes into a loved one's life, new girlfriend, new boyfriend, um, and they're taking advantage of that individual and that person's just their money's just over time disappearing. And it's all wrapped up in this, well, this is a, a relationship, they love me. It can be both physically and financially abusive. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it keeps coming back to like, the more you can have those open conversations and have that plan that even if it's, you know, we have a plan to travel, do all of these things. Well, then why did you veer off this way? This could be a signal of, of you know, but okay, well, we're <laughs> at the open conversations to build this plan together. Um, so one of the things that I think is tough, um, talking with siblings, right. And all, mm -hmm. we, our, my, the, our parents' home is not in great shape. They shouldn't be there, except your brother thinks maybe they're fine. And then your sister thinks maybe they're not. So how do you come to some agreement with that? What are, and then even if you are all in agreement, how do you have those conversations with your parents? So, you know, one process that I think is very effective is to hold regular, it's called family meetings. They don't have to be these big formal things, um, but have the money conversation as a family at least once a year. Use a natural milestone as a catalyst. So mm -hmm. it could be you're updating your will and it's just that time of year mm -hmm. or you're updating your health proxy. Um, and that is a great place to just ground yourself. And then you can start adding some of the complexity to the family conversation. So if you really want to start out positive, it can be about a value that you all share. So maybe that's um, charitable giving, mm -hmm. super positive. Right. Uh, and you can center it around where do we want our donation this year to go? Um, and why? You know, there's several families when they think about, you know, business as family and, and, and wealth intergenerationally make a tradition out of it um, where the well, original wealth creators, grandma and grandpa in this case, you know, work with the grandchildren and the grandchildren are tasked with identifying charities and every child can participate regardless of age um, that they'd like to see the donation go to. They have a vote after discussing it. Um, and then they send the check or, you know, write, write the, the donation onto their account. Mm -hmm. And it's a great learning exercise. So if you think about your desire just to gain experience in the financial realm, money lessons are a fantastic way to gain experience and knowledge and make money conversations so much easier because money we're just taught is taboo. So when you're talking about siblings and differences of opinions and geography challenges, that all adds complexity to the scenario, but it does start with having just the baseline conversation uh, and if you can all do it, you know, when people are still all within their faculties and control, it becomes about mom's wishes. And this is what she would like to do. And these are the responsibilities that have been doled out and accepted. So 
I would know in advance if my sister was the health proxy or mm -hmm. the trusted contact um, or going to joint meetings with her and her financial advisor. Mm -hmm. So if there is a need for us to take action, we're already operating like a team. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the communication. Mm -hmm. And again, it will take some time. So I understand that there's probably urgency for those that are in the moment where cognitive change has already happened, a uh, victim of a financial scam has already taken place. Use those as, as catalysts to get it going and work out a plan that works for everyone. And as you know, family dynamics can be really challenging. And not everyone wants a role or to have responsibility. So even if mom would like the eldest child to take the mantle, if you will, he or she may not be willing to do so. And if there are other children or another way to direct that role and responsibility, there's time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I think it can be tough, right? You, like you said, those family dynamics, mm -hmm. but, um, my mom's from a family of 10 and watching those oh. dynamics go back and forth, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it gets humbled and hurt feelings. So the more that is yeah. held up, I'm sure it's, it's that much easier. So with that, especially as you're talking about these multi-generational families, what's mm -hmm. the right age to bring bring folks in, right? So with my grandparents, we weren't going to talk to bring the four-year-old in talking about yeah. the family house. But when are the, I mean, is it, is, and is it like we stage it? Like they're, the youngers are part of one part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so what, what have you seen work well there? So in general, when children are young are old enough to start asking some really smart questions mm -hmm. about just money in general they're ready for information uh, i'll give you a personal example so a few years back my in-laws came up with this fantastic idea that we would all go down the colorado river for five days with uh as a family um, and we hit some rapids. This was on J-Rig rafts. So if you've ever been on a rapid, you know, level one, two is look, ma, no hands. I can stay in the raft. Mm -hmm. And it, a level 10 feels like you're inside the washing machine. So mm -hmm. when we first day hit maybe something around a three, nervous laughter erupted. And then when we pulled off later, my niece, who was 11 at the time, asked a really brave and I thought important question which is what happens when Nana and Grand Bob aren't here anymore? Because obviously the nervous laughter on the boat after we received the lesson about what to do if you fall out, you sign papers where yes, you may die. You know, they're seeing that because we're talking about it, they're listening. So at age 11, she was wise enough to recognize that unfortunately Nana and Grand Bob aren't going to be with her forever. They play an important role in her life. And she wasn't looking for great details on the estate plan. She was just looking for some general roles and responsibilities as role models mm -hmm. uh, for, for her. Mm -hmm. And that's a good time just to have some very high level conversations about here's who steps in, you know, mm -hmm. here's what may or may not change. Here's how that might impact you. Um, and you can use that and keep building off of that conversation over time. As be, children become independent and ultimately start earning a living and move out of the house, you know, that's a great milestone too, to start talk, talking about, this is what our retirement, mom and dad, looks like. And this is our contingency plan if these few things may happen. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to talk to you about who's who in our financial legal team. Mm -hmm. and some roles and responsibilities to see if you're willing to take them on or if there is no choice, meaning they have other people outside of immediate family stepping in, who are those individuals and why were they tapped? Um, it will be an uncomfortable conversation, but at that point, everyone's an adult. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about respecting their wishes and actively listening and not imposing your own personal views on, well, I think I should be the one, not my sister. Mm -hmm. You may feel that way and you're entitled to feel the feels but you want to try and not escalate the situation so you can have a productive conversation as a family because that's the goal. And even I'm thinking back to what you're saying, like with your niece, it's just, um, it doesn't have to be an in-depth answer, but just yeah. an answer to, and that makes it less scary, right? Just yeah. the fear for everybody, you know, to, to start to know that path. Exactly. And she only needed five minutes. Right. She did not need the lecture. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so we did have a question come in about um, ethical wills. 
Uh, mm -hmm. do you, can you talk a little bit about ethical wills, maybe explain them um, or, or not? <laughs> <laughs> so that's in an area that's not my expertise because it's more, I'm not a lawyer either. You mentioned I wasn't a scientist. <laughs> um, so I'm going to have to defer that to our, our legal experts um, to get into the nuances of defining that the right way for you. And also if it would be appropriate and at what, and at what stage of your uh, financial life. Okay, so what about, so it, that brings us to, do you need to have a lawyer to be able to, like legal will for sure. But what mm -hmm. if we say, um, you know, I want to write out that this is what I want at my funeral or uh, you know, to be played at my funeral or these are the values that I want. Do those kinds of things have to go through a lawyer or can some of that be just written out on paper and what's, you know, what have you seen work there? So what I've seen work that's not a legal document, but is an expression of values, uh, we would call a love letter. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice way of kind of wrapping up what your wishes, hopes are for those you leave behind and it can and again love letter is not prescriptive um you know it's not like a, a thank you letter for a job interview where you need to do three paragraphs worth of x y and z you can be whatever you want so we've seen love letters that you know are from families that have regular family meetings so it's just a personal expression of what um they hope will happen after, and it's part of their legal document package when they pass. Uh, and they've talked about things like, which have been part of the family meetings. So they had a second house, vacation home at the lake. Um, they talked on the letter about all their memories there. They shared a few wonderful stories. Um, and you could read between the lines because they had talked about it as a family that this was a piece of property, an asset that they had to collectively decided to stay in the family. and the three children were going to split it equally. Now that could have had a totally different outcome for another family where maybe they didn't reach that decision and it would be sold at the time of the owner's death. And then the proceeds are split. All different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Other love letters are highly prescriptive, which include things like what I would like for my funeral right down to the songs mm -hmm. um, and passages. And again, those are all things that can be included in a legal package or put with your important documents in a, in a safe deposit box. But again, you need to be able to communicate where that information is so people can act on your, on your wishes. You just have to recognize something like a love letter. I'm using that as a very general term because it is not a legal document. You know, it's, it's not etched in stone. Sure, but there's a warmth there. And what, yeah. what I keep coming back to is think like this is to help your parents my parents help them live the life they want this love letter mm -hmm. is, there's a warmth there of you've helped me to get here and that's hopefully that warmth may, takes you know takes some of the hurt away um so the two things as we're kind of wrapping up here the things that i'm taking away i love what you were talking about with your mom um talking about stuff that's on the news because again that mm -hmm. that really normalizes it like did you see that this is happening and she's bringing it up and and it's just you know, like here, we're, so we're all aware. Um, and I think the more you right. can bring, bring those conversations, then it doesn't have to get to that eventuality. Um, and then just what you said at the at the beginning, you know, it's knowledge is power. And, you know, it was whatever the, the school commercials or whatever says it, but it's, it's true, <laughs> yeah. the knowledge is power. So, and if you're coming at this with, I love you, that's why we're having this discussion and, you yes. know, earlier. So, what are the biggest takeaways you want um, this group to, to take with them besides the ones that I've launched? Oh, absolutely. So first and foremost, if you're proactive, then you're protecting yourself, your assets, and ultimately your loved ones, those you care about. If you're vigilant about taking a risk managed approach, you're also giving yourself the control that I know you want. Mm -hmm. um, we, we all do. So you can take the time while we are most able to get your roadmap ironed out in a way that is truly tailored to what your vision may be. And it's a, it's a living, breathing plan. So you should be looking at it on a regular basis. You can make changes. Uh, just remember, you know, you have to do the complete comprehensive approach if you're making changes. So any legal documentation that needs to execute formally on any uh, next steps is also in place. So 
break it down into digestible bites because it's going to take some time. And then the third thing is get comfortable talking about money as a family. And if you have young children, as soon as they're, you know, asking questions, using money, just think about it as financial literacy. You're building their knowledge and you're also helping share the values of what it takes to, you know, earn money, why we spend what we spend, uh, you know, broadly speaking, what it takes to get this house in and out of the door each month mm -hmm. uh, to more sophisticated questions like this is how we're helping contribute to your college education um, or, you know, more grand things like we would like to contribute to, you know, down payment on a house or here's a mortgage broker when you're ready to do mortgage when you buy your first home, how much not to buy too much house. All those things, if you can get comfortable talking about it, then you can get to the hard stuff, mm -hmm. like planning for a contingency plan that's not pleasant mm -hmm. and preparing for end of life planning mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do it in advance, then you get the control, peace of mind and engagement mm -hmm. that you're looking for. But I think most importantly out of any of this, if you have the ability to work with trusted financial advisor that is a fiduciary, and then the right legal team to help you put these pieces in place, then you're really doing yourself uh, a good job because it's an important investment mm -hmm. in you. And I would argue it's probably one of the most important investments you'll ever make is in yourself by having that trusted sounding board that can really help you see things uh, and know things that you just don't. And it's, you're not less intelligent by receiving the advice. What you're doing is maximizing the resources you have to work with. And you probably will find yourself being able to do more than you thought possible. I would imagine a far better result working with someone like that who can guide all of the conversations. Um, I would have one last little personal example that, that kind of came to me as you were talking through this, just as you approach this with love, you know, I had a good friend who was worried about having her parents had been in their house for forever. And it was steps and she wanted them to be able to get out. And they kept saying, we want to consider it. We, what about here? What about there? And they said, no, 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 we want to be here. And then finally, all of a sudden they changed their mind. Okay, we'll, we'll come out there. And she said, what, you know, you were, you guys were going to stay in the house forever. What, why did you finally change your mind? And her dad said, because I saw you get so upset and you were like, I'm, I'm so worried about you. And his thing was he had protected his girls forever, right? So yeah. all of a sudden she was coming out with love. She wasn't taking control. She wasn't doing any of this. He didn't want her to worry. So, you know, like, I don't want you to worry. So you have those conversations about love with love. And yeah, and if there's an advisor there, then it takes a lot of the heated, the emotion out of it, the bad emotion stuff. So yeah, that's a great story and probably far more common than we give it credit for when you think of some of the reasons for why we do what we do or what the nudge ultimately ended up being that was the catalyst for the about face. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Do the worry, right. So, and that's the point. Put these plans in place so that nobody worries. So mm -hmm. um, Bree, thank you so much. Um, I'm impressed with the behavior of your puppies, but of course more <laughs> behind you, but more impressed with how much, you know, how much thought you've given to this and such great advice uh, to, to be able to help folks. So thank you so very much for spending some time with us. Oh, my really pleasure. Good. I appreciate being included. Absolutely. And for anybody that's got questions, um, please reach out to your advisor. They can help you with checklists and, um, and to be able to facilitate these conversations. So thanks for being a part of this with us all and goodbye, everyone. Happy spring.